Welcome to the webinar, What the Bible Says About Prophecy with Ray Duhon. We encourage you to download the supplemental study guides, charts, and articles to help enhance your study of tonight's subject by going to the articles page on rayduhon.com. Without further ado, here's Ray. Tonight, we talk about the deadly four angels of the apocalypse. They're in Revelation chapter 9, verses 13 through 21. And here we see this passage describes the sixth trumpet judgment, which is also the second woe judgment. This is also the second of three angelic attacks on the unsaved of the earth. Each attack is worse than the one before. The first angelic attack is the excruciatingly tormenting stings of the demon locust for five months, which we saw last week. The second angelic attack comes in the form of the bee conscripted into Satan's army or die plan. To demonstrate how horrible this attack is, these angels kill one third of the remaining population of the earth in the process of recruiting their 200 million man army. The final angelic attack we will see in chapter 11 of Revelation and is the most horrific attack upon unrepentant mankind of all because it removes all hope of survival from the remaining inhabitants of the earth and leaves a certain dread of pending doom about to happen. So let's take a look this evening with the cry from the altar to carry out judgment. The verse in, or the voice in verse 13 comes from the altar of sacrifice in heaven, under which the souls of the murdered saints are praying for vengeance. Read it with me. Then the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, Revelation 9, verse 13. This is the place where the prayers of the saints have been offered. They have been introduced to those prayers on two occasions. The first is in Revelation 6, 9 through 11. Here we see these martyred saints asking God to avenge them, but we see God telling them that the time has not yet come. As we progress to chapter 9, we understand that the prayers of the saints are being answered. The second occasion where we see prayers of the saints being offered is Revelation 8.3. What are these prayers? The prayers of these saints who have lost their lives for their faith are cursing prayers. They are asking God when he will judge the earth. And by asking for judgment, cursing it. God never tells us that their prayers are wrong. In fact, chapter 9 is the answer to those prayers. It is time for judgment to begin in earnest. Now, God likes to use things. In fact, he uses Satan's forces against Satan himself. There are two kinds of angels in the Bible. We are introduced to the good angels in the seventh chapter, in Revelation 7, verse 1. These good angels do the bidding of God and act as servants to God. Then there are the bad angels who have followed Satan into sin and war against God. We call these angels demons, and there are four here that are being released. Look at verse 14. Saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates, verse 14. The angels mentioned in Revelation 9:14 are evil angels localized at the river Euphrates, and they are releasing the forces of evil upon the whole earth. There is no record in the Bible of any good angels ever being bound or restrained. Dr. John Walford writes this, The four angels bound in the Euphrates River are evil angels who are loosed on the occasion of the sounding of the sixth trumpet, in order to execute this judgment. It is another instance of the loosing of wicked angels, similar to the release of the demonic locusts earlier in the fifth trumpet. Now, the Euphrates River is the most important river mentioned in the Bible. 
It flows from the Armenian mountains to the Persian Gulf, and it is 1,780 miles long. It flows from where the Garden of Eden was, which was the center of the perfect environment for mankind. We see this river mentioned again in Revelation 16, 12, when the sixth angel pours out the sixth bowl of wrath, drying up the Euphrates River, which had been turned to blood, to allow this 200 million man army to proceed to Armageddon. Now, the Babylon of old is also right there uh, between the two rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates, where they both come together about where the third ball of chain is, about in that location. And that's where the old city of Babylon used to be and the Tower of Babel before that, and uh, a lot of speculation about the Babylon of Revelation 17 and 18 being resurrected there. That is to be determined. Well, the precise time of judgment is the focus of this verse here. The angels are loosed and they are to do something special. Look at verse 15. And the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and day and month and year were released, so they would kill a third of mankind. Now, we just read a third of mankind is killed. Who has this been targeted? We see here that the expression here is referring to an hour and a day and a month and a year. That does not designate the duration of their activity, but rather the appointed time of their activity. It is like saying at the exact second, at the exact moment on God's calendar, this judgment will be let loose on the earth. We must remember that we do not have the date and we don't need it. God has that date, but that is not the important part. God has it time to the minute when he will have all of the armies in the world unite and assembled on the battlefield for the final battle of Armageddon. Now, let's take a look at the target against, uh, uh, again, it is the unrepentant mankind. We must read that, we just read in verse uh, 15 there that uh, the mankind, a third of them, has been killed. Who has been targeted by the Lord for this judgment? Does this include everybody, including Christians? Now, we could assume that, but we would be wrong. Again, the rules of proper interpretation give us the answer. Rule number two says don't take it out of context. Revelation 9.15 says that it is a third of mankind. Now, if we remember from our previous webinars, we will recall that one-fourth of the world's population has already been killed, okay, in Revelation chapter 6, verse 8. There, and that was at the, uh, at, the, at the end of the fifth seal, or rather the, yeah, the fourth seal, where a fourth of the population was killed off. Now it says in verse 15, that another one, uh, another third of mankind is destroyed at the sixth trumpet there. Now, when you total those two figures together, again, uh, against the current population of 7.9 billion, then we see that one half of the original population number is still alive after the effects of all of these judgments to that point. Skipping down to verse 20 and 21, we can identify what group that the targeted one-third of mankind belonged to. Here it says, the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands so as not to worship demons and the idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders, nor of their witchcraft, nor of their sexual immorality, nor of their thefts. Revelation 9, verses 20 through 21. Does this group here sound like they belong to the church? No. The church, again, is spared the attack because it is only those who are unrepentant who are attacked. This is key to understanding how God spares his own while others are being judged. 
Remember, since the breaking of the sixth seal, when the Antichrist desecrated the temple and began his war on Christians and Jews, the saints have been dying for their faith. These saints are being killed by Satan's forces while these judgments are taking place. The big difference between the deaths of the saints and the ain'ts is the destination of everyone who dies. The saints end up before the throne of God, protected and praising God. The unregenerated, unregenerated inhabitants of the world wind up in hell waiting for the final judgment. With this judgment of chapter 9, one-third of the remaining inhabitants are killed. If you do the calculation, you will find that this leaves less than one-half of the original number of persons alive on the earth. Not since the Great Flood has such a substance, substantial proportion of the earth's population come under God's righteous judgment. Understanding the judgment of the sixth trumpet okay now we've seen several verses here in a row that seem to be disconnected and start various trains of thought leaving us in confusion including verse 16 which says the number of armies of the horsemen was 200 million i heard the number of them revelation 9 16 so let's dig this out of the mud of confusion a little bit so what exactly is god doing through this judgment Remember, rule number two says don't take it out of context. And rule number 10, think like a Jew, will answer this question. And by doing so, we can see God's brilliant two-pronged pincer movement strategy in this judgment. We see three facts here in, this, in these previous verses here. In verse 13 and 14, we see a voice is speaking from the altar where the martyrs are kept safe. We also see this voice gives a command to release the four angels who will kill one third of the remaining population of the earth, verses 14 and 15. And then the third thing is a 200 million man army is to be drafted, verses 16 through 19. Now the voice speaking from the altar is not specifically identified. However, since the high priest is the person who deals with the sacrifices on the altar in the Jewish culture. Remember rule number 10, think like a Jew. We can assume that this voice may be from our high priest, Jesus, who is about to deal with the sacrifices of his saints who are under the altar. Remember, this was written to the Jews for the Jews to understand, so they would recognize that immediately. In other words, Jesus is in the process of answering the prayers of vengeance for, from the murdered saints. Now, God is using two strategies here at the same time in the answer to these prayers. First, the most obvious strategy. God, Jesus is answering these prayers by releasing these angels to attack the murderers of the saints. God's vengeance is carried out on these murderers by these wicked angels who execute these murderers in their mission. Remember, God is always in control and everything in these wicked angels' mission, God is using as part of his plan and program. The four evil angels at the Euphrates River are prepared to carry out God's judgment at a specific time, although they have no clue that they are being used in this way. They are so tunnel visioned with hatred toward God that all they can see is recruiting an army to fight God. They cannot see how they are being used by God to execute judgment upon the earth through this recruitment process. Does this make God evil by allowing evil to destroy evil? By no means. Absolutely not. Emphatically, no. A second strategy God is using here is this. By releasing these angels, God is effectively slowing down and even stopping the further murderers of his saints by sending these evil angels to recruit this 200 million man army from among the murderers of his saints. Those who refuse to be conscripted or drafted into this massive army are killed by these evil angels. 
which is the vengeance part of the answer to prayers. With the evil mankind forced to focus on their choice of being required to fight in this army or die, they don't have time to continue their war on the church, so they stop. Why? Because they are now focused on themselves with this problem of being recruited into this massive army. Thus, we see God's pincer movement of, re of vengeance on one side and stopping the further loss of saints on the other side. What about the remaining murderers that are left alive? Those murderers who have been shanghaied into the massive army will see their end at the Battle of Armageddon. Mission is completed. Brilliant. These angels have been given the precise hour, the day, the month, and the year for them to begin their join the army or die campaign where they, they destroy one third of the earth's remaining population while they build this mega army. Just out of curiosity, researching the current number of all the armies of all of the countries worldwide, according to Google, the total came to 27,671,000 personnel as of 2019 from, quote, officially recognized sources, which means that they aren't going to reveal the total military strength of each country for their national security reasons. Even if this number is accurate, this is why these angels are released at this point in time, because it will take all of the, that, that time for them to assemble all of these armies and recruit, or rather conscript, or Shanghai, if you want to call it that, another 172,329,000 people to reach that 200 million mark that they are to assemble to bring to war against God. Now, let's add a little extra spice to the mix with some speculation. Just like in John 6, where Jesus fed the 5,000, the scripture said he fed 5,000 men, not counting the women and children. So conservatively, he fed anywhere from 15 to 20,000 people, as most scholars point out. Looking at this passage once again, it says, the armies of the horsemen was 200 million. Interesting. This term horsemen means cavalry. In today's cavalry, that means tanks. And in each M1A Abrams tank in the U.S. military, there is a crew of four, the commander, the gunner, the loader, and the driver. You could easily say that just the tank crews would be 200 million or 50 million tanks, not counting infantry, air support, ground support, naval support, and command as the modern army is today. Thus, everyone who can be drafted, conscripted, shanghaied, or forced into service is there whether they want to be or not. Who knows the total number if that's just the number of the cavalry. Now, in Revelation 16, 12, it says this. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river, the Euphrates, and its water was dried up so that the way would be prepared for the kings from the east. Now, this verse it is my assumption that the vast majority of this tremendous army of 200 million is from the east. Most of the people who hate the Jews already are on the east side of the Euphrates River. So that is where most of them would come from, although these angels are conscripting or drafting people involuntarily all over the world into their massive army. Does this denote China and her Confederate nations? Yes. And Russia and Iran, Korea, and every other country in the world, including the United States. Could the Chinese or anyone assemble such a massive army? Again, yes. But we are looking from a human point of view. 
Remember, it is these four wicked angels who have been given charge of this operation. And with the brutality of this conscripting and the anger fueled against God, these angels will have no problem mustering 200 million men. Another fact to consider, the church has been underground for years in most of these countries east of the Euphrates River because it is illegal to become a Christian in these countries, and the persecution of the church is constantly going on there even today. If this army were assembled in China, could such a number of troops be moved across the continent to the arena of battle? Recently, it's been dis re, uh, discovered that the Chinese soldiers are at work inside of Pakistan-held Kashmir on a road that would give the Chinese troops in Tibet a shortcut to the subcontinent. India has called the Chinese road building a threat to peace in Asia. When this road is completed, it will make possible the rapid movement of millions of troops in the Middle East. It will literally pave the way for John's prophecy to be fulfilled and the way of the kings of the East will be prepared. Another fact we need to understand, although the passage refers to the kings of the East, we need to think bigger than just the Chinese. We need to think worldwide, including the US, Europe, Africa, South and Central America, Australia, but especially the Muslim nations of the Middle East as we know them today. There are over one and a half billion, with a B, Muslims in the world today, most of which inhabit the lands east of the Euphrates River. Also remember when Jesus was visited by the wise men from the east, the portion of the world they came from was around Basra in Iraq. Susa, which was the capital of Persia and encompasses Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and several other Middle Eastern countries through there. They will definitely be included in that mega army. Now let's take a look at what is describing the weapons of war there in verses 17 through 19. It says this, and this is how I saw in my vision of the horses and those who sat on them. The riders had breastplates the color of fire, of hyacinth, and of brimstone, and the heads of the horses are like the heads of lions, and out of their mouths came fire and smoke and brimstone. A third of mankind was killed by these three plagues, by the fire, the smoke, and the brimstone which came out of the mouths. Notice he's talking about the plagues are the fire, the smoke, and the brimstone. That's what he's talking to about when he refers to those three plagues. So, and then he says in verse 19, for the power of the horses is in their mouths and in their tails, for their tails are like serpents and have heads, and with them they do harm, Revelation 9, 17 through 19. Since nothing in John's day was known about our modern weapons, John could have used uh, only terms that would be symbolic. These warriors are declared to have breastplates of fire and of jacinth, which is reddish orange in color, and brimstone, which is also sulfur. The heads of the horses are compared to heads of lions out of whose mouths fire, smoke, and brimstone issue. The 19th verse says that the power is in their mouths and in their tails. Their tails are said to be like serpents, and even the tails have heads with which they can hurt men. Note that the terms lions, horses, and serpents all speak of deadly force. Verse 18 adds the dimensions of fire, smoke, and brimstone, which would also fit into the modern description of warfare. Remember, they didn't even have gunpowder back in those days, which contains sulfur. And when fired, also produces smoke. They had no concept of napalm or even nuclear warfare, which could easily kill one third of the world's population. How would you describe a battalion of tanks and an artillery battalion to the first century mind? Both of these would produce destruction from the mouth and from the tail. Remember, they tow artillery or cannons behind trucks backwards. 
Verse 18 says it is with these weapons that a third of the population is killed. Understand that the source from which these four angels came, which gathered this massive army, is the Euphrates River. It would not be hard to understand why evil had a power source there. W.A. Criswell wrote this in his book, Expository Sermons on Revelation. He says this, It was the place where sin was first known, where misery first began, where the first lie was told, where the first murder was committed, where the first grave was dug. The Euphrates River was the scene of the rise of Israel's greatest and most oppressive enemies. The Euphrates River was the scene of the two great apostasies before and after the flood. The Euphrates River was the scene of the long years in which the children of Israel dragged out their wearisome days of their captivity. The Euphrates River was the scene of the rise of those great world empires that oppressed civilization in the ancient days, cruel Persians and the Medes. Well, what is the reaction of the judged? After reading such an awful judgment upon the earth, one would think that anyone who went through this judgment and escaped this murderous draft and escaped with their lives with fall, would fall down before God with repentance and pleas of mercy. But their hearts are hardened, and they respond to the judgment of God with added rebellion. Look at how Revelation 9, 20, and 21 describes them again. These are the people that this judgment falls on, not the church. The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, so as not to worship demons and the idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders, nor of their witchcraft, nor of their sexual immorality, nor of their thefts, Revelation 9, 20, and 21. Well, let's take a look at this and dissect this a little bit. Their worship. These hardened pagans are worshiping materialism, the works of their own hands, idols of money, jewelry, and possessions. Note the descending value of the gods they serve, gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood. Since demon worship goes hand in hand with idolatry, it is no surprise to see people worshiping devils. There may be much religion practice at this time, but it will be false religion. And notice who they worship the most, King Me. Second thing we see in there is their works. That when people believe, what people believe determines what they do. Out of one's belief system, a lifestyle is developed. Verse 21 that we see up there says, and they did not repent of their murders, nor of their witchcraft, nor of their sexual immorality, nor of their thefts tells us of the four sins that will be especially rampant during this period. First of all is murders. Someone has said that whenever the gospel is unknown, human life is cheap. It seems pagans have no problem with the taking of human life if it serves their purpose. Violent murders will be very common during the tribulation period. Over a century ago, J.A. Seiss, the author of The Apocalypse, predicted on the basis of Revelation 9.21 that capital punishment would have been largely abolished by the time of the tribulation. He saw the day when murderers would be spared punishment because society, rather than the individual, would be held responsible for their crimes. How true that is today. Second one is sorceries or witchcraft. Witchcraft has often been linked with sorcery throughout scripture as being the same thing. It is also interesting to note that the Greek word for sorceries used in this passage is the word pharmakia, which literally translated means pharmacy and refers to the practice of the occult accompanied by the use of drugs. In Revelation twenty-two fifteen. 15, 
These sorcerers or drug pushers are classed with dogs, murderers, fornicators, and idolaters. And we are, are told that they have no place in the heavenly city, the New Jerusalem. The third one is fornication, or pornea is the Greek word for it, is nothing less than the rampant immorality. Pornea refers to all kinds of sexual activity outside the bonds of married love. When divine restraint is withdrawn, human passions will break loose and morality will be discarded in favor of liberty and, quote, free love, end quote. Most of the world today look at it as something biological and having no consequences because they can erase their consequences with abortion since they have been taught that we are nothing more than animals acting out animal instincts and abortion is just removing a lump of flesh like a tumor. The consequences of listening to these lies of Satan is more death physical and spiritual of the individual and of the nation. And the fourth thing on that list there is thefts. With all laws relaxed and the mutual respect for each other's rights almost gone, greed will be the great motivator as those who survived the war try to prey on each other. This will no doubt include burglaries and armed robberies as well as embezzlement and fraud. We have already seen that happen on a mass scale in the 2020 riots, where police law and the protection were removed from certain parts of the country, and the looters were never punished. Well, let's take a look at the conclusion. Final thought about sin's effect on mankind. It is a solemn thing to realize that even judgment like that will that which we have just described will have no effect on hardened, unregenerated man. Twice we are told that those who experience the wrath of God do not repent. Why? Because first of all, sin paralyzes a person. Man with, without God is hardened because of his rebellion against God. Only the gospel through the working of the Holy Spirit can change that heart of stone and turn it into a heart of flesh. Sin paralyzes a person. It makes it impossible for one to respond to the grace of God. To those who do not respond, God sends a great delusion. We also see that sin hardens a person's heart. The more we sin, the more calloused our conscience gets towards sin, to where we don't care anymore. When we experience total apathy, which is, by the way, the opposite of love, we are like that lump of clay that has been hardened and it becomes useless and will be crushed and thrown away. Third thing is, once we experience then rejecting grace, God sends a delusion to prevent repentance again. We see this in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, where he sends that to the church who becomes apostate, and he hardens their hearts so that they cannot return back to God. God sends a delusion or a spirit of delusion to keep a hardened heart from repenting, like he did to Pharaoh. Once sin reaches a certain point, God will cause a person to not be able to repent so that he can reap the full harvest of his sin. Don't expect God to keep forgiving you repeatedly for sins. You have no intention of stopping. And the th fourth thing there, good news. We like to end it on good news. The next trumpet call brings us home and locks in everyone's destination. The Christian has nothing to fear from these judgments since the Christian is protected from God's wrath. The good news is that God loves you and offers you eternal life. Now is the decision time. Today is the day of your salvation. You can either choose Christ and follow him as Lord or face him as judge. Our prayer is that you choose him and live. But don't wait until it's too late to make that choice. You will not like it if he has to choose for you. You have seen the judgments to come 
except the last one, which takes away all hope from mankind and dooms unrepentant man to an eternity in hell. The better news is that the next trumpet blast announces his coming to bring his bride home and locks everyone's destination for good or for bad. Father, we pray that today that we will have our hearts tuned to you, that we can be like the people in the day of Pentecost to have our hearts pricked to where we say, men and brethren, what must we do to be saved? And Father, we pray that you will turn and have us to get closer to you, to obey you, and to follow you. And as we follow you, we draw closer to you every day, knowing that our faith in you is what's going to bring us home. And our trust in you will be fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Father, we pray that today that you will use us to continue to be your ambassadors until you come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.